Tonight we're going to finish up the study that we started a few weeks ago, and it's called the NIV Denies the Deity of Christ. And what this is, is we've, I took the old outline that I did a few weeks ago in church, uh, which showed, proved the deity of Christ from the King James Bible, and I didn't cherry pick verses or anything because I wasn't even thinking of doing this study at that time. And after the fact, I thought it would be neat to go through the same outline that I used to prove the deity of Christ. And I basically thought of every verse that I could in the Bible that proved the deity of Christ in that study. I thought it would be neat to take that same outline and then look at it with the, the NIV and with the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Bible, and to see if those, well, we know the Jehovah's Witness Bible wouldn't, but to see if the NIV would prove the deity of Christ like the King James does. And so we've been looking at this for two weeks now, and tonight we'll start on page 17 of the outline, if you have one, on point 11. And the point that was made in the outline was that Jesus is the Savior. And if you, when we compare that with another verse, we'll see that only God is the Savior, so therefore Jesus has to be God if he's the Savior, and God says that God is the only Savior. In Titus 1 and verse 4, in the King James, it says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it says to Titus, A genuine child, according to the faith we share, may you have undeserved kindness and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Now, do you notice any difference in those two verses. If you weren't paying real close attention, you probably would have read right over it. Um, I gave this one a pass and a fail. It's a pass because it does say that Jesus is the Savior, which was the main point that we were going for in the verse. But it gets a fail because it doesn't call Jesus Lord. The New World Translation just says Christ Jesus our Savior, whereas the NIV, or I'm sorry, the, the King James says the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. So it fails on not calling him Lord, it does pass calling him the Savior. Now interestingly, the NIV follows the New World Translation, the Jehovah's Witness Bible, on this verse as it does in so many. The NIV says to Titus, My true Son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. So once again, same wording as the, the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it leaves off the word Lord there. Now, the thing is, the point is, that God says that nobody besides God himself is the Savior. So if you, if you just think about that, if God says there's no Savior beside me, and then Jesus says I'm the Savior, what does that mean? It means that Jesus is God, or else he's lying, one of the two. Isaiah 43 and verse 11, in the King James, the Lord, this is the Lord Jehovah. He says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So if Jesus is called the Savior, that means that Jesus has to be the Lord Jehovah. Because God says, there is no Savior beside me, and yet Jesus is the Savior. So that means that Jesus is God Jehovah. Now the Jehovah's Witness Bible does say basically the same thing on this one. It says, I, I, it says, I, I am Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. So it's interesting, like I said before, when the Jehovah's Witness Bible passes on these verse, verses, it actually fails its own doctrine. Because the Jehovah's Witness doctrine is that Jesus is not God. So here you have a verse in the Jehovah's Witness Bible where Jehovah says, I am Jehovah and beside me there is no Savior. And then in Titus 1.4, in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it says, Christ Jesus, our Savior. So their own book proves that Jesus Christ is God in their comparing their own scripture. So that's why I say it passes on the point on the on the point that I was trying to make in the outline, but it actually fails their own doctrine. So it's kind of like the Jehovah's Witness Bible is damned if they do, damned if they don't. They're damned if they change the scripture and, and pervert the words of God to take Christ out of it, or they've damned themselves if they leave the scripture alone and it condemns their own doctrine that says Jesus is not God. So they, they get it coming or going. The NIV gets a, a pass on this verse also. It says, I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. 
So the NIV does prove the deity of Christ in that verse, though it does leave off the word Lord, so it certainly takes away from his lordship. The next point that was made in that outline was that Thomas called Jesus his Lord and his God. This is a pretty good proof for the deity of Christ. Listen to this verse and tell me if you don't think that Thomas is saying that Jesus Christ is God. John 20 and verse 28 says, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And he's speaking to Jesus. Clearly he's saying, You are my God, to Jesus standing right in front of him. Now I don't know why the New World Translation didn't change this verse, but it says, In answer, Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. My guess would be, and I've never talked to one of these guys about this verse, they would probably say it was an ex, and they put an exclamation point there. So they would probably say it was an exclamation. Thomas was just saying, my God, or something, you know, instead of actually calling Jesus his God. I'm guessing would be the way that they would explain that away, which is probably why they put the exclamation point there. The NIV likewise says, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, exclamation point. Every, not every time, but so many times the NIV follows the New World Translation. Every time. And once again, I should, you know, I should have failed it for the exclamation point. Because the exclamation point would just give them an out to say, well, he wasn't really calling him God. He was just exclaiming, like, oh my God, I'm just so surprised. Like, here you are with your, you got the marks in your hands and you're actually alive or something. So I should have probably failed that one. So the things that the apostles said about Jesus Christ would be completely absurd and blasphemous if Jesus was just a man. They couldn't say the things about him that they said. And I'll give you some examples of some of the things that they said. And this is great because the NIV and the New World Translation just fail one after another. Here are plain declarations from the apostles that shows that Jesus is God. NIV just one after another. Fail, fail, fail. So let's look at some of these here. Ephesians 3 and verse 9. The King James, it says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So this verse says that God created the world and all things by Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the creator God. Now if you can believe that, you can imagine this, the New World Translation changes this verse, because this one would flat out contradict their doctrine. It says, and should make everyone see the administration of the sacred secret that has been hidden through the ages in God who created all things. They left off three very important words. The King James says he created all things by Jesus Christ. They leave that off. The NIV says the same thing as the New World Translation and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Once again, the NIV follows the New World Translation. It's so funny to me, and I've made this point before, but I'll make it again, that most Christians would take the New World Translation and say that thing is not a Bible, that it has clearly been corrupted to take away the deity of Christ. And that's an indisputable, incontrovertible fact. And most Christians that know anything about the New World Translation would say that. And like I said, with Bible Gateway, it's a popular Bible website, and they've got dozens of Bible versions on it, almost every Bible version under the sun. They don't have the New World Translation on that because they recognize it. It's just a complete perversion of the Scripture. It's so funny to me, though, that the NIV follows that New World Translation so many times, has the same corruptions in it, takes away the deity of Christ the same way. Mm -hmm. But the same Christian that would throw that that New World Translation in the fire and say this thing's a corruption of the Word of God would hold up his NIV and say, I believe in the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God or whatever and talking about the NIV and it says the same thing. All right, Hebrews 1 and verse 2. It says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So this says God made the worlds by his Son, by Jesus Christ. And we know that it was Jesus Christ, the Word, that made the worlds. It says that uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
John 1, 1 and 2. Now let's look at the New World Translation, Hebrews 1, 2. It says, now at the end of these days, it doesn't even say in these last days, at the end of these days, but anyway. He has spoken to us by means of a son, not by his son, but by means of a son. Just somebody, you know, every man is a son. So if God spoke to us by any person, it could be, it could be said that he spoke to us by a son. I mean, this thing, uh, to go over all the errors in the New World Translation would take us all night. But anyway, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the systems of things. He made the system. The, the King James says he made the worlds. The New World Translation says he made the systems of things. <laughs> okay. Well, I failed this one because it, say, it uses the word through instead of by. You notice that the King James says by whom also he made the worlds. The New World Translation says through whom he made the systems of things. Now, by and through can mean similar things sometimes, but if you think about it, if you say God made the worlds by Jesus Christ, he's saying that Jesus made them. But if you say he made them through Jesus Christ, you could almost look at it as Jesus was just kind of the mechanism that God made things, but he just kind of went through Jesus to do it. So by Jesus Christ means that Jesus did it, right? Through Jesus Christ means that God kind of did it working through him. You could easily see that explanation. And I guarantee you that's why they say through <laughs> instead of by. Because the through fits the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Because that's exactly what the Jehovah's Witness say. That God used Jesus. That God created Jesus first. Before the, before the world was created, God first created Jesus. And then used Jesus. You, through him created the rest of the world. So that's Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Interesting thing is, the NIV says the same thing. It says... In Hebrews 1, 2, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. So, the NIV follows the New World Translation. Again. So they both get a fail on that one. Pastor? Yeah. Now, I don't know, you might address this at some point. It might be a stupid question. <clears throat> but our church is exclusively, we only use King James. Mm -hmm. When I was a Catholic... We didn't even use a Bible. Yeah. Generally, in churches, is there, do they require a certain Bible? Like, do Lutherans require to use? Is there something mm. where they're generally using the same type, or you, can you just use whatever you want? To? In most churches that I've been uh, familiar with in the past, they pretty much just say one's as good as the other. Okay. And, um... There are some other King James churches out there that use King James only. Um, in a Catholic church, I'm sure you wouldn't walk in. They wouldn't want you to walk in there with the King James. I would think they'd use the the is the New American Bible, New Jerusalem Bible, I think, or the the Catholic versions. But in most of these churches that you know, you see when you're driving down the road, it's just if they even if people even bring a Bible to church, it's whatever, you know. And everybody that's why when you go to these Bible studies, and it's somebody's and the guy says. Well, the Bible says this, and somebody's like, well, that's not what my Bible says. <laughs> well, mine says this, and mine says that. and So, yeah, it's utter confusion. Have you ever seen a statistic that shows generally what people use, what is being used most widely um, out there for the Lord's work? The, the NIV was, for a while, was the most popular version, I think. I think it's being supplanted by the English Standard Version. The ESV is the, the popular one these days. I don't know. I haven't seen statistics exactly which ones are the most popular. I think, unless this has recently changed, the King James is still the most widely sold Bible, though, oh. I think. And it, for a long time, it was the most widely sold book, period. It may still be. I don't know. So, yeah, I don't know. People still, still like them, which is good. But, but yeah, and the church that I grew up in, it was just people the, in the in the pews. They had NIVs, and but everybody had a different version. And the pastor was preaching out of a King James towards the end before I left, which is good. But yeah, for the most part, it's all Bibles are created equal. We think that uh, some are created more equal than others, but to 
to use an Animal Farm reference if, <laughs> if you've ever read that book. But anyway. I watching on YouTube, I noticed that they would use different, one group is using two or three different Bibles. Well, you'll find what they'll do is they'll use whatever version proves the point that they want to make. So, and you'll see this in books, I see this in books all the time. The authors, if they don't use the King James, they'll usually use whatever, and you'll see them quoting different versions. And the reason is they like this one says it a little better, so they, they can make their point better. So rather than just going to the Bible and letting the Bible make their doctrine for them, they come up with their doctrine and then go find a Bible that will support whatever point they want to make. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6 is the next verse. It says, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So it says that the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, all things are by him. So this is, a, this is a tacit admission that Jesus is God, because you see the contrast here. They say we believe in one God, of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. So, if all things are of God and all things are by Christ, what's that tell you? It tells us that Christ is God. But the New World Translation, once again, changes by to through. It says, There is actually to us one God, the Father, from whom all things are and we for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things are and we through him. So I've already explained the difference between by and through. So they can fit their doctrine into that by changing by to through. The NIV does the same thing. It says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Changes by to through, like the Jehovah's Witness Bible did. And if you also notice, minor thing, but if you look in, um, the King James says, in one Lord Jesus Christ, no commas there. The New World Translation and the NIV say, in one Lord, comma, Jesus Christ. So whatever the significance of that is, it's interesting the NIV and the New World Translation both say it the same way, differently than the King James. So for the, the King James, it's a title, Lord Jesus Christ. In the other ones, it's, a, it's the Lord, comma, Jesus Christ. So there is a, a, a difference there. All right, here's the next one, Colossians 1 and verse 16. It says, For by him, that's by Christ, by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him clear statement that Jesus Christ is the creator God, right? New World Translation, Colossians 1.16. Because by means of him all things were created in the, he in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So, Number one, we see the through being re replaced, the by being replaced by through. But here's another one. I don't know if you noticed this one. This is so subtle. You read right over it and you don't notice. Let me read it again. Because by him all other things were created. All other things. See, in the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, Jesus is one of the things that was created. God created Jesus as the first thing, and then through Jesus created all other things. That's Jehovah's Witness doctrine. All other things. So all they had to do is add in one little word, one little five-letter word, other, and they changed the entire meaning of the text. This is why when I, when I first read over this, I read over it and didn't even notice it. And then I got looking, I'm like, oh, they added a word in there, and that totally changes the doctrine. The NIV follows suit. It doesn't add other, but it does change by to through. It says, For in him all things were created, things in, heaven and things, on, or, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him 
and for him. So once again, changes by him to through. And it says, oh, see, here we go. There's another change there too. The King James says, for by him were all things created in the beginning of the verse. The NIV says, for in him all things were created. In him and by him are not the same thing. In him can lend to the Jehovah's Witness doctrine once again. God worked in Christ or something, but by him shows that Jesus did it himself. So once again, the NIV follows the New World Translation. Of course, we know that God created all things, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The New World Translation and the NIV managed to get this one right, except they do say heavens instead of heaven. The, the King James says God created the heaven and the earth. And then he created the heavens after that. He created the stars, which are in the heavens. He created the atmosphere, which is called the heaven. He separated the waters from, from below, the waters from above, from the waters from below. And he called that the firmament heaven. So the Bible teaches that there are three heavens. There's heaven where God lives. There's heaven outer space where the stars live. And then there's heavens where, heaven on earth where the birds live. So there's three different heavens. And that's why Paul says that he was caught up to the third heaven three different heavens. The NIV says that God created the heavens on the first day, and that's not true. He created the heaven, and he created the heavens later. So the NIV and the New World Translation get that messed up too. It says in Colossians 1.17 that all things consist by Christ. Who else, what other being in the universe, what other man or angel could this be said of, that all things consist by him? Obviously, Jesus has to be God for all things to consist by him. It says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, the New World Translation says, He is before all other things. Notice that? Add a little other in there. He is before all other things, and by means of him all other things were made to exist. That doesn't even say the same thing anyway. It says all other things were made to exist, and it, the, the King James says, by him all things consist. So it adds in other, which changes the verse, and it also, no, I guess that's, that's what it did. It didn't do the by and through thing this time. The NIV fails in this one too. It says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Once again, they changed by to in. The King James says, by him all things consist. Jesus is doing it. He's the sovereign ruler of the universe and he's holding everything together. But the NIV says, in him all things hold together. So the, the, the language is just not as strong. There's leeway there in the NIV. Consist means to have a settled existence, subsist or hold together, exist or be. So this could not be said of any man or angel without blaspheming. What man could say that he holds the universe together from flying apart? Nobody. Not even Michael the Archangel could claim power like that. Only somebody who is God himself. And that's why the Jehovah's Witness has to change it. Before him all other things, and by means of him all other things were made to exist. And see, that's the thing. It doesn't even say, I just keep I'm just noticing this, the, the New World Translation doesn't say by him all things consist. It says they were made to exist. So in their mind, Jesus Christ is not the omnipotent God that's holding the universe together. He just made it to exist. Like he just made it and let it go. That's different from what the King James says. It says in Colossians 1.18 that Christ has the preeminence in all things. It says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Preeminence is higher rank or distinction, priority of place, precedence, or superiority. This is declaring the omnipotence of Jesus Christ. He has the preeminence. He's the boss. He's the ruler of the entire universe. And who is the ruler of the entire universe? God is the ruler. So if Jesus has the preeminence, it's claiming that King James is saying that he's God. If you can imagine, the New World Translation fails in this one. 
It says, And he is the head of the body, the congregation. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might become the one who is first in all things. It doesn't say he has the preeminence. The one who is first. The NIV actually gets a pass in this one. It says, In everything he might have the supremacy. So, which is a word that's pretty well similar to preeminence. So, I give the NIV its due. If it actually gets something right, you know, a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while, stop clocks right twice a day, so I give it its due. It says in Colossians 1.19 that in him all fullness dwells. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So, we read, we'll read here in the, in the next verse, what this is talking about here when it says in him the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth bodily. But first in this one, in him all fullness dwells. Interestingly enough, the New World Translation and the IV get this one right. New World Translation says because God was pleased to have all fullness to dwell in him. And the NIV says for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. So I, I don't have a bone with them to pick on that one. But the next verse, Colossians 2 9, where it explains, it explains what this fullness is, that it's the fullness of the Godhead bodily, then they both fail. So they get one verse right. They get Colossians 1 19 right, that doesn't explicitly say that it's the fullness of God dwelling in him. So they can get that one right, because you couldn't really prove maybe that Jesus Christ is God with that verse alone. But then the verse that you compare that with to prove it, they mess that one up. Colossians 2.9. In the King James it says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now God's omnipotent. God's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. If in Christ dwells all the fullness of God, that means that Christ has to be omnipotent and that Christ has to be omnipresent. Because you can't fit an infinite God into a finite person like you or I, or like an angel for that matter. So Christ has to be infinite. He has to be God himself for all the fullness of the Godhead to dwell in him. The New World Translation, of course, messes this up. It says, Because it is in him that all the fullness of the divine quality dwells bodily. All the fullness of the divine quality. I don't even know what that means. But it certainly doesn't say all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in him. The divine quality. The NIV says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Of the deity. There's lots of deities out there. You know, the false gods are called deities. So, all the fullness of the deity. That's not the Godhead. Once again, it just, it, it's, it just takes it down a notch. It lessens the punch there. Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is the express image of God's person. It says, Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So the King James says that Jesus Christ is the express image of God's person. Express image means... Let me define the word separately. Express means of an image or likeness. It's truly depicted exactly resembling exact. Now, chiefly with reminiscence of Hebrews 1.3. So, it actually cites Hebrews 1.3 as the usage of this definition. So, an express image is an image that is truly depicted exactly resembling. So, Christ is the exact representation of God. An image is an artificial imitation or representation of the external form of any object, especially of a person, or of the bust of a person. Such an imitation in the solid form, a statue, effigy, sculpted figure. So, it's as if Jesus Christ is a sculpture of God in an exact, perfect representation of God. So, if you took God and you sculpted him out in a body, it would look like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the exact image. That's why whenever Philip said, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us, Jesus said, Philip, how long have I been with you? And you asked me, show me the Father. He said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So when you look at Jesus Christ, you've seen God the Father because he's the exact image of him. But not if you read the New World Translation. 
It says he is the reflection of God's glory in the exact representation of his very being. And he sustains all things by the word of his power. And after he had made purification for our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. It replaces the brightness with reflection. The King James says, who being the brightness of his glory. You see, God is, God's glory is splendid. It is, um, he, God is called light. God is light. Jesus Christ is called the light of the world. And when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he was transfigured into the, the radiant, glowing, bright image of God, they couldn't even, the disciples couldn't even look at him. Well, when you say that he's a reflection of God's glory, reflection and brightness are not the same thing. Reflection takes away from the glory of Jesus Christ. The NIV actually does get this part of the verse that we're considering pretty well right. It says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the ex exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty in heaven. See, the King James says, when he had by himself purged our sins. The NIV says, when he had provided purifications for sins. It doesn't say by himself, and it doesn't say our sins. He just purified sins. The King James specifies whose sins they were. They were particular people's sins, our sins, and he did it all by himself. Once again, showing the power, the divinity of Jesus Christ, purging sins by himself, but not in the NIV. I think the Jehovah's Witness one fails on that one too. After he had made purification for our sins, so at least gets the our part right, but it doesn't say by himself. Big surprise. Hebrews 1, 4, it says that Jesus is made so much better than the angels. It says, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. The New World Translation says, So he has become better than the angels to the extent that he has, an inherited, he has inherited a name more excellent than theirs. Once again, it takes away from the deity of Christ. It takes out so much. No, no pun intended, but it, it takes out the words so much. It also it takes out so much stuff, but it does take out the words so much. Let me read it. Hebrew, in Hebrews 1, 4 in the King James, it says, Being made so much better than the angels. But in the New World Translation, it says, and he has become better than the angels. Not so much better, just a little bit better. You see, God is so much better than the angels, but not in the New World Translation. It, it seems as if he may have been at the same level as the angels, and yeah. then has become. Oh, it's yeah. Like he somehow mm -hmm. attained something more than the angels. Well, it does say in, in the book of Hebrews that he was made a little lower than the angels, and then when he was glorified, he was glorified above the angels. So that part would be true, but it doesn't say that he was made so much better. Mm -hmm. It's like in the New World Translation, he was just made just better, a little bit better. Mm -hmm. not, not all that much of a distinction between Jesus and the angels in the New World Translation. The NIV says... So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So I kind of see the same thing as, as the other one. I'm stuck on has become in the New World Translation. Mm -hmm. And then he became. It's, it, it just seems as if he started out mm -hmm. not in oh. his full glory. Right, but yeah. in the King James version, being made so much better, like mm -hmm. from the from the get go, mm -hmm. he was so much better. Right, yeah, and this yeah, and has become, and it doesn't specify when he became better than the angels right. in these other versions. Right, yeah, he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited has inherited is superior to theirs. So it doesn't, even that doesn't necessarily say that he's become so much better, that he is so much better than the angels. They kind of in a roundabout way saying, well, he's as much superior to them 
as his name is is superior to them and you're like okay well how much superior is his name like you know I mean, it's just mm -hmm. like there's just a, another layer of the onion in the NIV that you have to peel back to try to figure out what exactly they're saying mm -hmm. so I should have failed it I did pass it on that one I actually probably should have failed it I'm, I'm just I'm a softy I guess as much as I hate the NIV you would think I just <laughs> fail it every time but I'm trying to be somewhat fair here <laughs> All right, uh, Titus six fifteen through 16. Not Titus, 1 Timothy, pardon me. It says here that Jesus is the blessed and only potentate. It says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to him or to whom be glory and power everlasting. Amen. Now the New World Translation changes this one around a little bit and fails. It says, To observe the commandment in a spotless and incomprehensible way until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which the happy and only potentate will show in its own appointed times, he is the king of those who rule as kings and lord of those who rule as lords, the one alone having immortality. So this is worded in such a way which it fails to state that Jesus Christ is the blessed and only potentate. Because it just, he says there, the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ which the happy and only potentate will show in his own appointed, appointed times. So it doesn't, what they're, what they're saying, I think, they've changed it to say that God is the only potentate and God will show Jesus Christ in time. See, it doesn't say, the King James says flat out that he is the, ble that Jesus Christ is the blessed and only potentate. But the New World Translation doesn't word it in such a way that it says that. So yeah, look at, look at what it says there in the King James. It uses the word who. Who is the blessed and only potentate? The New World Translation says, which the happy and only potentate will show. So just a little change there would be enough for them to say, well, the only potentate is God himself not Jesus Christ. You might think I'm straining in a gnat here, but this is how the devil does it. He just changes it just enough that it changes the text, and you couldn't make the point anymore from these Bibles. The, um, the NIV does something similar here. It says, To keep this commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal. See, the NIV is even worse. The NIV does not say that Jesus Christ is the blessed and only potentate. It says that God is the blessed and only ruler. It doesn't say that Jesus Christ is at all. It changes who to God, which fails to state that Jesus is the blessed and only potentate. So in this case, the NIV is actually worse than the New World Translation. Jesus is said to be the head of all things, and all things are under his feet in Ephesians 1 and verse 22. It says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now the New World Translation and the NIV do get this one right virtually. So I gave them a pass on this one. But once again, with the New World Translation, if all things are put under his feet and he's the sovereign ruler of all creation, that's saying that he's God. So, whoa. Wow. All right, next point. It says that every knee shall bow to Jesus Christ and confess that he is Lord in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. It says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The New World Translation and the NIV 
both pretty much say the same thing. So they are, in a sense, upholding the deity of Christ in this verse that's saying that every soul will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In, um, in Revelation one in Revelation 5.13, it says, In every creature that is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And they, the other ones get that one right as well too, which, you know, is a is a maybe not a proof text, but it's certainly a reference text to Jesus Christ, pardon me, being God and being worthy of all honor and glory and blessing and power. It says in Romans 14, 10 through 11, or 10 through 12, that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account to ourselves, of ourselves, to God. So the King James here shows us by reading this whole this, this whole section, this whole um, three verses here, this passage, shows us that Christ is God. But the New World Translation and the NIV do not show that, and I'll show you how. Romans 14, 10 through 12, it says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Whose judgment seat is it? Christ's, right? Let's keep reading. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. So it says that we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of ourselves to God. Who's sitting on that judgment seat that we're giving an account of ourselves to? Christ. God. Jesus Christ is God. But you don't get that from these other versions. New World Translation says, But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you also look down on your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. See that? The King James says we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This says we'll stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As surely as I live, says Jehovah, to me every knee will bend and every tongue will make open acknowledgement to God. So then each of us will render an account of himself to God. You see, you can't prove that Christ is God from this verse because Christ isn't even mentioned in the New World Translation. It says we'll stand before the judgment seat of God and give an account of ourselves to God. That doesn't prove that Jesus Christ is God. It doesn't even mention Jesus Christ. But the King James says we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account to God. Christ is God sitting on the judgment seat. The NIV doesn't do any better. It says, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. See? It says God instead of Christ. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. No mention of Christ being God in the NIV or the New World Translation. It says that God hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world in the King James, which shows us that Jesus Christ is God. If you're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, obviously there was no other being around before the foundation of the world to be chosen in. So you, Christ has to be God if we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. It says in the, in the King James, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, the New World Translation says, As he chose us to be in union with him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and unblemished before him in love. Chose us to be in union with him, not in him, but to be in union with him. The NIV actually does get this one right, close to it anyway, even though the wording is not as nice as the King James. It says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. The King James says that Jesus Christ abolished the Old Covenant in his flesh. So when Jesus died on the cross, that Old Testament law of Moses died along with him. 
he abolished it, he put it away, it says it was done away, and we're no longer under that old law of Moses anymore. It says in Ephesians 2.15, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Remember, the point is that only God can abolish his own law. Nobody else can abolish God's law. It's God's law. But Jesus could abolish God's law because Jesus is God. Now, the New World Translation gets a pass on this, but the NIV gets a fail on it. So here are the New World Translations better than the NIV. It says, By means of his flesh he abolished the enmity, the law of commandments consisting in decrees, in order to make the two groups in union with himself into one new man and to make peace. So, the New World Translation says that Jesus Christ abolished God's law. They are really admitting that Jesus Christ is God, because only, only God can abolish his own law. But the NIV doesn't even say that he abolished it. It says, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. It changed abolished to setting aside. Abolished means to do away with, to, to just get rid of it entirely. The NIV says he set it aside, like he may use it again sometime. You know, just kind of put it over here. Don't, don't harm it or anything. Just you know, leave it intact, and, and then you know, in the millennium we'll bring that thing out again whenever the Jews are ruling the world again in the millennium. I don't know if that's where they're getting at, what they're getting at, or what. But anyway, it's yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised at all. The works that Jesus did demand that He's God. Um, in the um, actually, the New World Translation passes on this one too. Luke eight thirty nine. It says, Jesus said, Return to thine house, this is after he healed a guy, return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. So Jesus tells him, tell, you, tell everybody what God did, and he goes and tells them what Jesus did. Put it together, Jesus is God. The New World Translation actually gets this one right. It says, Go back home and keep on relating what God did for you. So he went away proclaiming through the whole city what Jesus had done for him. Now it does admit, omit great things. The Bible said, the King James says, how great things God hath done. And in the New World Translation it just says, relate what God did for you. But still it does, you know, Jesus in the New World Translation says, tell him what God did. And then he went and told him what Jesus did. It's kind of hard being a New World Translation translator because you have to, First of all, understand the Bible well enough to understand all the, to recognize all the verses that are declaring the deity of Christ, and then you got to take them all out. And sometimes they miss them. You know, hey, nobody's perfect all the time, right? So they, they <laughs> didn't quite succeed in completely obliterating Jesus Christ out of the Bible. The NIV actually gets this one right too. Now, of course, we're told in Psalm 72 and verse 18 that only God can do wondrous things. So when we see these examples of Jesus doing wonderful things, amazing, astonishing, miraculous things, we know that only God can do things like that. So this is a proof that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, some of the miraculous things that Jesus did was knowing men's thoughts. It says in Luke 6 and verse 8, but he knew their thoughts. Now, the other Bibles do get this one right. Um, sort of. The New World Translation says, He, however, knew their reasoning. Reasoning, thoughts, I don't know. I'm not going to split it hairs. So the fact is, if Jesus knew their thoughts in the New World Translation, well, they're admitting that he's God. Who else besides God, know, God knows your thoughts? I know sometimes that spouses think that each other ought to know their, know their thoughts, but of course, of course we can't, right? <laughs> I guess Jesus, the church is the bride of Christ, so we could say that there's one spouse anyway that knows his bride's thoughts. But as for the rest of you, you're out of luck. <laughs> the, um, the NIV gets that one right too. Jesus knew what they were thinking, it says. Uh, Luke 9.47, same thing, perceiving the thought of their heart. 
the New World Translation and the NIV get that right. Uh, John 2, 24 through 25, which says that uh, Jesus knew all men, for he knew what was in man. They get that one right as well. It says um, in Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, that Jesus is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Dividing, or I'm sorry, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, if you stopped right there, you'd think we're talking about the Bible, the Word of God, right? That's what it says. But you think about it is this Bible a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart? I mean, can this Bible read your mind? No, this Bible, it's paper. I mean, it doesn't read your mind. Jesus Christ, the Word of God, can read your mind. He's living and, you know, quick and powerful. He's living and powerful. But the Bible does not read your mind. The Jehovah's Witness Bible actually gets this one right. But the NIV screws it up. Let me read the let me read verse 13 though to finish my thought. It says neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. It uses that pronoun his to refer back to the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there anything not manifest in his sight, in the word of God's sight. So, thir- verse 13 shows us that we're talking about Jesus Christ in verse 12, not the Bible. It says, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The word of God, him with whom we have to do. The New World Translation actually gets that one right. It says his sight, and it says the eyes of the one uh, to whom we must give an account. So it, it actually does refer back to the word of God, saying that it's referring to Jesus Christ. So it, it passes, but it fails, because it says that Jesus Christ is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, which only God can do. But the NIV actually messes it up. It says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged or double-edged sword. It, 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 you see that? Mm -hmm. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I don't know about you, but my Lord Jesus Christ is not called an it. (laughs) Now the NIV's quote, Jesus Christ, is called an it. He is an it. But anyway. Verse 13. Now look what it does. It, It messes up verse 13, which doesn't refer back to Jesus Christ as being the personal pronoun him. It says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So it changes it to it, says the word of God is it, and then it says nothing is in creation is hidden from God's sight. So when you say it's not hidden from God's sight, you don't link it back to realizing that verse 13 is talking about the word of God, Jesus Christ. Breaks that link. And of course we know that only God knows the hearts of the children of men. I'll just read it to you in the King James, the actual, these other Bibles actually get it right. It says, Then hear thou from heaven, this is Solomon's prayer when he dedicated the temple, Then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and do, and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Only God knows the hearts of the children of men. The King James says that Jesus Christ knows men's hearts. He's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts. So what's the-